Thank you, Mark. We are continuing our studies in the book of Colossians. We're in chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 10. Paul has just stated his gratitude, his uh, rejoicing to see them in uh, discipline and stability in their faith. But now he does have a word of caution for them, a word of warning. He writes in verse 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. One of the most famous events in the history of the American frontier happened not far from here when the Parker clan, a family of primitive Baptists, moved to Texas. They built a fort, which was wise. One morning when the men were outside of it working the fields and defenseless, Comanches came, attacked, and took the women captive. One of them was nine-year-old Cynthia Ann Parker. When she was rescued 25 years later, she was, in her mind, a Comanche, and never changed. She died longing for the tribe, for the high plains, and worshiping the Great Spirit. If there's a lesson in that, it is know the danger and stay in the fort. It's the lesson that Paul gives in Colossians 2, verses 6 through 10. He says, walk in Christ and see that no one takes you captive. A cult had come to Colossae to spread its ideas and enlist new converts. The teachers were more subtle than Comanches and more deadly. Paul begins to to expose their error in chapter 2. But first, he warns the Colossians. He has just praised them for their order and stability in the faith. He had confidence in them, but still, still, he adds a word of caution and counsel in verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. At first glance, you might think Paul is giving instruction on the Christian life, on how to to walk in the Christian life, how to live by faith day by day. That's what we're to do. We enter into the Christian life through faith in Christ, and, and every day is to be lived in that way, by faith, trusting in Him for everything. And of course, that is certainly true. But that's not Paul's meaning here. He means the doctrine of Christ that you began with when you believe the gospel is the doctrine that you must continue with and not some new version of it, some false interpretation of it. I think we have some evidence for that idea other places. For example, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23, Paul used this word received to speak of the doctrine of the Lord's Supper that The resurrected Christ taught to him that he received and that he believed. He said, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and he explains the doctrine or the uh, the, uh, practice of the Lord's Supper. He received it though. He believed the doctrine that was taught to him. And that's what Paul means here. They were taught and they received doctrine. And it's stated very simply in the words, Christ Jesus the Lord. 
Now that simple expression has three points that really are to be emphasized and are to be understood in it. And first is, he is Christ. Literally, the Christ. He's the anointed one, and that's what Christ or Messiah means. It's the one who is anointed. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about the one who is prophet, priest, and king. He's the Messiah. And secondly, he is Jesus. That is, as you know, his human name. It was the name that was given to him at his birth, which attests to him being the, an historical person, attests to him being a man of history. He had a birth. He had a human life. He had a, 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 the life of a, of a man with a genuine soul and mind and body. But in the Lord's case, this name that is given to him also defines his reason for becoming a genuine, true man. The reason he entered into human history, when the angel announced the birth of Christ to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, or verse 21, he instructed him on the name that was to be given to him. He said that Mary would bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Greek equivalent of Joshua. It means Yahweh saves or the Lord saves. So when his mother called him as a child or when anyone called out to Jesus, they were saying the gospel. They were saying the Lord saves. They were saying salvation is of the Lord. The Colossians believed in him as that, as the Savior. That's what they received. That's the truth they were given. They trusted in him as the one who bought them, who redeemed them through his sacrifice on the cross. He is the man, the genuine man who died in their place. You should never forget that it is essential that we understand that Jesus Christ is a genuine human being, like you and me, yet without sin. Because only a man could be a substitute for mankind. He had to become one of us to be our substitute. And they had believed that. They understood Jesus. They understood the man who was their representative. But he's more than a man. He is the Lord, and that speaks of his deity. This brief statement, Christ Jesus the Lord, is really a summary of all that Paul has taught in the first chapter of this book. He is the image of the invisible God, he said in chapter 1. He is, the, he is God the Son. He is the eternal creator and sustainer of the universe. He is the redeemer of sinners. All of that has been set forth in the first chapter, and that is what they originally received when the gospel was brought to Colossae by Epaphras. The gospel is simple. It's stated very clearly, very simply, very directly in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, when Paul and Silas gave it to this man who was in despair, who'd come to the end of himself, the Philippian jailer, he said, what must I do to be saved? And they answered it, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Not believe in Jesus and be baptized. Not believe and join the church. Now those are important things to do. We, we, we are to be baptized and we are to join ourselves to the church, but we do that because we have been saved. Baptism is a testimony to that fact. And because we've been joined to the body of Christ, we join ourselves in the body of Christ and devote ourselves to that. But the gospel is very simple. It's believe. Believe plus nothing. Believe in Jesus Christ. But we must not only believe, we must believe the truth. And that statement, Jesus Christ, the object of our faith, is essential because faith is only as good as its object. Everyone has faith. The atheist has faith. The question is, what's his or her faith in? The object is essential. And so Paul states the object clearly. Christ is Savior because he is God and man. And as the God-man, he became our substitute and our sacrifice. 
There are lots of Jesuses in the world. People knock on your door or they ride their bicycles through your neighborhood offering a different Jesus from the one described here and preached by the apostles. The Jesus of the Mormons or the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses is a kind of uh, avatar, uh, a heavenly being, but not, not God and not really essentially different from the angels. The Jesus of liberalism. He's not even that. He's simply a man, a good man, a great example, a great teacher, but just a man. Well, those are different Jesuses from the Christ of the Scriptures and the Jesus of the Apostles. So faith must have the right object. A person must believe the right doctrine in order to believe in the right person. The Colossians had done that. And Paul was telling them not to move away from that truth which the gospel was, which they originally received. Not to move away from the true message. Not to move away from this statement that he has given about Christ Jesus the Lord. That's what they had originally received. Continue in it, he is telling them. But it's more than that. When, when they believed, they received more than a creed. They received Him. We have a living Savior. When we believe in Him, we have a personal relationship with Him. We are actually placed in Him. So Paul says, walk in Him. That, self, that itself indicates a relationship. All through Scripture, the, the life of God's people is described as a walk. You see that in the early chapters of the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24, we read of Enoch. And Enoch walked with God 300 years. And then God took him. Walked with God. That's what we are to be doing. We're to walk with Christ. And here he says, his, he gives instruction to walk in him which means live in and by the truth of Him, the truth about Him. Don't depart from that truth. But also, in this uh, mystical sense, if we can use that word, the mystical union that we have with Him, we are to live in Him. We're to walk in Him. The mystery that Paul revealed in chapter 1 is Christ in you. He is in us. He's in us through the Holy Spirit and we are placed in Him. So He lives in us. We live in Him just like uh, branches live in a vine. That's how Jesus described us and our relationship to Him in John chapter 15 and verse 5. We have been in some sense, some spiritual sense, but some real sense placed in Him and He is in us. We draw our vitality from Him. That produces growth in branches. It produces growth in the believer. And that's, that's here. That's in what Paul is saying. But a walk also su suggests progress, movement along a path and, and toward a destination. It's as we hold firm to the truth we have in Christ as we hold, truth to, hold true to Him, that we progress. We progress in knowledge and we progress and mature in conduct. Now, if the Colossians would do that, they would not only make progress in the faith and in their relationship with Christ, but they would also fortify themselves against the heresy that was there in their city, that which they were dealing with. But all of the error that they would face throughout their lives. That is the great defense of it. Walking in Christ, staying true to Him and growing in that relationship with Him. And Paul explains that in verse 7, that continuing in what they received, in the truth that they received, and in Christ, in walking in Him, that gives stability and growth. There's no greater preparation for life's challenges than that. And every one of us will face life's challenges along the way. Some more than others. But we all face challenges. And this is the great preparation for that. 
Walk in him, he says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him. Built up in Christ. Since Christians have been rooted firmly in Christ at the moment of their conversion, they have an unshakable foundation. And based on that foundation, they can grow up and be built up in the faith and become stable in the faith and in life. Paul was using two pictures to describe the Christian life in this verse. First, that of a tree and then that of a building. He probably had Psalm 1 in mind when he wrote of the Colossians being firmly rooted because that's the description of the, the person who is blessed or who is happy in that psalm. He or she delights in the Word of God, meditates in it day and night so that he or she will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Such a person is stable like a tree whose roots go down deep into the soil. Storms will come, but the tree can't be shaken because its roots are deep. Its foundation is solid. That's the person who delights in Christ. He or she is stable and grows. A person can't grow if he isn't rooted in the truth, assured and stable. He's like a, a tumbleweed, not like a firmly rooted tree. If you've ever driven across the Texas panhandle, you've seen tumbleweeds. The wind blows them across the road. They have no root in the ground. Now that's the person or the persons that Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 when he calls them children. And he doesn't speak of them approvingly with that word in that context, he speaks of them as being immature, as being children that are carried about by every wind of doctrine. They're not mature in their thinking. They're not well grounded. They are easily shaken and easily taken in by the latest spiritual fad and fashion, always drawn to something new and something different. They're not like the tree of Psalm 1. They are spiritual tumbleweeds. No root in the truth. No firm grounding in the Word of God. It's those who have been firmly rooted in Christ who are stable, who are confident in the truth, and, and because of that they can grow and develop. They are now being built up in Him, Christ, uh, in Christ. Paul says. So you've been rooted and grounded. That happens at the moment of faith. And, and because of that, you are being built up in him. That gives the second picture that Paul uh, presents here, that of a building going up. That is a healthy Christian. He, she is a work in progress. We are always in this life a work in progress. We have never and we will never arrive fully and completely in this world and in this life. We are constantly developing, growing. And that's what he describes here. It's like a building under construction. The building is only as stable as its foundation. And I, I think Paul may have had illustrations of that. I know he did. Uh, maybe he's drawing upon those from, from all that was around him while imprisoned because Rome was filled with unstable structures. Uh, it had some very stable ones. Caesar Augustus made a boast toward the end of his life and he had brought a great deal of glory to the city of Rome and expanded the empire and he said, I found the city of Rome a city of bricks and I left it a city of marble." Well, there was a lot of marble buildings there, but not all of them. A lot of buildings were made of cheap stuff and built on very unstable ground. And the result was the city was constantly filled with the noise of buildings collapsing. That was one of the great fears of the population. People lived in constant expectation of their tenements or their apartments, and they'd build buildings that were five, ten stories high. And they'd collapse. They'd fall on their heads. And that's what they were worried about, or fall into the streets. There was always this danger daily of this kind of thing. 
The foundation matters. Buildings with a, a firm foundation can be built tall and reliably. And they stand. They don't fall. And so it is with the Christian. Those rooted in Christ are being built. And they can be built higher and greater. And that's what happens with us. As we are rooted in the truth and we are living consistently with that truth and we are studying that truth, we will grow in that truth and grow great and grow strong. Well, Paul has mixed his metaphors here. Being rooted in Christ, we have the stability of a solid foundation like a foundation of granite. But this is a different foundation as well. This is a living foundation. We are in Christ and we receive his life. But that life is nourished by the word of God. We, are, we have the life of Christ in us, but the way we develop that life is through the study of God's word. It's like, it's like the, the, the water that feeds the tree by the stream in Psalm 1. Streams of water that that tree draws from. And that's what we do through, through the study and the comprehension of God's revelation through the study of Scripture. It is the means of growth in the Christian life. Those who hold to that truth will grow in their knowledge of Christ and in, in true doctrine and will mature in the use of it. They will be wise. They will be people who increase in their discernment and in their relationship with the Lord. They will grow closer to him. That's what Paul goes on to say. As they, as we are being built up, we are being established in our faith. We are continually being more firmly grounded in the basic truths of the Christian faith. We never grow out of what we received at the very beginning the basics of Christianity, the fundamentals of the faith. We never go beyond them in the sense that we leave them behind. We are always rooted in them and we grow deeper in our understanding of them and our knowledge of them, our appreciation of them and our assurance of the truth of them. We never grow out of the fundamentals of knowing that Jesus Christ is how he is described here as the man the Messiah, the one who was Lord, the one who is God, the God, man, and our sacrifice. That is fundamental to the Christian life. That's fundamental truth. And we never grow away from that. We only grow deeper in our understanding of it and application of it. In fact, we must be constantly looking to him. We must be constantly knowing and growing in the fundamentals of the faith the fundamentals of Christ himself. He is, uh, we could say, the, the north star of the Christian life. The ancient mariners, as you know, navigated the seas by looking at the north star. It was a, a fixed point of reference. And they could know where they were in light of that. Some years ago, we were up in New England and we had gone up north to visit a National Park, and we were coming back, and so as I'm traveling, I began to sense something's not right here. This doesn't look familiar, and I don't, am I going the right direction? And it's getting late. It was about five or so in the afternoon, and I looked out to my left, and I could see the sun setting. Well, if the sun is setting on my left, then I must be going north, and I need to be going south, so from the sun's position, I was able to navigate properly and get going in the right direction. Well, that's the idea. We have a fixed or a constant sense of, of a standard by which to gain our direction. And that's what Christ is. And, and that's what we must do. Focus on him. It's what the author of Hebrews tells us to do in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, where you're, you know, talk about the, the race of faith there, and he says how we run that race is by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. We're constantly looking to him, constantly looking to the truth regarding him. That's what we must do, because Christ 
keeps us in the right path as we walk through life, as we journey through this world, which is a hostile world in which we live. We need to be keeping our eyes on Him. And the result of that is given next. The result of that is happiness. It's thanksgiving. We will be overflowing with gratitude, Paul says. Now that should characterize the Christian life. Thankfulness. We have received everything. Now that's true of everyone. Everyone in the world, believer or non-believer, has what they have by the grace and the goodness of God. The unbeliever just doesn't know it. Should know it, doesn't know it, but you and I know it. And that should affect the way we live. We've received everything. We have achieved nothing. Now what I mean by that is we didn't earn a thing. What we achieve is achieved by the grace of God and by the application of our energies and our mind to the things of God, but ultimately that's the work of God in us. And I think you see that here in just the statements that Paul's ma Paul has made. Have you noticed that all that he has said here is passive, not active, it's passive. Having been firmly rooted, being built up, being established, we didn't ground ourselves or build ourselves. This is what the Lord, by His grace, has and is doing for us. Now, we're responsible. I'll come back to that point, because I think we have to come back to that point. We're responsible to be active in the faith, to study and to, to think and to pray and to, to persevere. But God always takes the initiative, which is effective, and results in our faith and action. So there's nothing for us to boast in. All we can really do is thank Him. And there, there's no better response than that. No more appropriate response than being grateful to God, being thankful, being joyful in our thanksgiving. And we, we can tell a lot about ourselves by that very thing. Are we grateful for God's grace? Uh, life gets difficult, and life has pressures for all of us. And some, as I have mentioned before, go through greater difficulties than others. But all of us, regardless of our circumstances, have the hope of glory. This life is short, and the trials of it will end, and we'll be blessed greatly through our perseverance through it. Blessed in this life, but blessed for all eternity. So things are, the trials of life are temporary for us. We have much to be thankful for, to constantly keep those, our life in that perspective and be thankful and rejoice. So are we doing that? Are we grateful for God's grace? Are we a thankful people? Are we a joyful people? If not, maybe our minds have been set on the wrong things. Maybe we're thinking about the wrong things. It's so easy to get caught up in the world and get caught up in the daily routine of things that we really take our minds off the things that we should be thinking about. So that life becomes something of a grind for us, really, instead of a joyful experience. We, we forget what we have. We forget who we are and what we're to be doing. We get into the grind. And I can say that that's even true of a Bible teacher. Now, to some extent, that's hard to avoid because... We all have schedules, we have deadlines, we have things that we must get done. You have a sermon to preach and you have to get to your desk and study the things that are necessary to produce that and be able to present it. Get up early, stay up late, whatever it takes, that is, that is part of the process. That's my life. But you have the same thing in various things and we all find ourselves sometimes overwhelmed by the circumstances and find ourselves in the grind. That's, I think, to some extent, perhaps unavoidable, but we need to keep in mind that we need to be thinking about the things of God and beware of grinding and getting into a routine and forgetting what's important and forgetting the things of the Lord. Paul will deal with that in the next chapter, really. He, he tells us, in chapter, chapter 3, set your mind on the things above. This is, how you're to, this is how we're to live. Now this takes discipline, but this is how you and I are to live our lives. 
not thinking about the things below, not keeping our mind on all the details of this life. Yes, you've got to live an orderly and disciplined life, but keep your mind on the things above, on the things of God and His grace. Things like the hope of glory, which he spoke of in chapter 1, verse 27. Keep your eyes on the north star of Christ Jesus. Joy and thankfulness are the spontaneous response of walking in the truth and walking with the Lord. They are the natural response of fellowship with Christ who is in us. Now that's the most effective defense against error. Those who know the truth, who hold to it and walk with Christ, know the real thing. And they will not be taken in by error, by counterfeit Christs or counterfeit Gospels. That's the, the positive part of Paul's instruction here. Walk in Him. The negative is, and don't get captured on the way. Don't get away from Christ. That's what Paul says next in verses 8 through 10. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. Now, I don't think Paul was necessarily condemning philosophy here. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. That's good. In fact, Paul even quotes philosophers in a few places, three places that I can think of. I don't think Paul was enamored of philosophy and was promoting philosophy in any sense, but what he's doing here is opposing this false teaching that had come to Colossae that was dressed up in philosophical language and sounded authoritative, but was only human speculation and empty. We gather from what Paul says about it that it was largely Jewish teaching taken from the law with its restrictions on diet and uh, promotion of various uh, rules, but it was also evidently mixed with Greek ideas. Commentators often identify the, the heresy that had come to Colossae as Gnosticism. Gnosticism really didn't become full-blown until the second century, so sometimes they speak of proto-Gnosticism, kind of the, the forerunner to a full-blown Gnosticism, but that, that is probably the, the general sense of what this teaching was that had come to the city. Uh, the name Gnosticism, I probably have talked about this earlier in our studies, but it is taken from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And the Gnostics claimed to have secret knowledge that no one else had. They had the mystics that would enable people to become spiritual and mature and, and maneuver through the difficulties of this world and, and through the difficulties out in in the other world that we would have to uh, maneuver past to get to, to God. So it was a mystical kind of thing, but also a combination of Greek philosophy and, in some cases, Christianity. Well, this is what the church father Tertullian dealt with. Tertullian was a brilliant lawyer of the second, third century who defended the faith against Gnosticism. And he asked, what indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? In other words, what unity can there possibly be between human philosophy and divine revelation? What harmony can there be between the city where philosophy was born and the city where the Psalms were sung? Between Plato and Paul? Between the church and the world? What harmony is there between them? None. Gnosticism mixed them, diluted and destroyed the gospel with that mix. Now, it's really not altogether clear what the false teachers taught. There's speculation about that. But what is clear is what they denied. And they denied the deity of Christ. They denied the sufficiency of Christ and his sacrifice. They dishonored Christ. Not, not explicitly, but implicitly they did. Paul rejected all of that. He called it empty deception, according to the tradition of men, 
not according to divine revelation. It is according, he said, to the elementary principles of the world, not Christ. Now that indicates something important about this heresy, that it was very Jewish and legalistic in its bent and its substance, because that word elementary refers to the rudiments, the basics, the ABCs of something. Paul used this expression, the elementary principles, in Galatians chapter 4 in reference to the law and its rules and regulations. It is the basic part of religion. The law is a necessary part of religion, not to gain or promote righteousness, because we can't gain righteousness through the law, but to show us that very thing, to give us the standard of righteousness, the standard of God's character, in order to show us how far short we fall of it. But when it is taught as a means of righteousness and a means of obtaining acceptance with God, then it is false. And that's was, that was part of this heresy. It was promoting a works salvation, a rules-based religion, which is enslaving and always results in failure and hypocrisy. That is not according to Christ, Paul says. False teachers spoke of Christ, and no doubt they spoke well of Christ. He's a great teacher. He's very important. We need Christ but we need more than Christ. Christ alone is inadequate. That's not the Christ Paul knew and the Colossians received. He is sufficient for salvation and for all things. But false teachers are clever. They use biblical words. They appear as light. They, to, they appear to be uh, servants of Christ speak of Him, speak well of Him, speak as though they're Christians and true. In fact, this is the description that Paul gives of the false teachers, the ministers of Satan, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 15. He says, they disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. They're not servants of righteousness, but that's the disguise that they use. And that's what makes them effective and makes them seductive. J. Gresham Machen warned of that in his book, Christianity and Liberalism. I've, I've referred to this book more than once, and I do so because it's a classic. And it's as valuable today as the day it was written. It's written and published in 1927. And it, it is an excellent um, exposure of liberal theology. And he was very keen to do that and, and knowledgeable of it because he was almost captured by it. When he was a student at Princeton Seminary, he went to Germany for a year and studied under one of the leading liberals of the day, Wilhelm Hermann. And he was captivated by his lectures. It wasn't so much the intellectual argument that he gave. In fact, uh, Machen described Hermann as being uh, illogical. It was the force of his fervent religious spirit. That's what captivated Machen. He described him as alive. That was the word he used, as having a, a deeper devotion to Christ than anything that he knew in himself. He is a wonderful man, he wrote in one of his letters home. He was almost captured. Later, he came to see that the Christ to whom Hermann was so fervently devoted never really existed. He, the, the, the teacher elevated religious experience over belief in the Bible. It wasn't the Christ of the Bible that he was devoted to, but, from, but to a Christ of his own imagination, not grounded in the Word of God. Often it's not the error of the cults that attracts people, but their enthusiasm. They seem alive. Or it's the, the community that they have. It seems real and warm. They, they promote good things. They promote virtues, family values, hard work, patriotism. But they have all, they have, uh, all have a, a very different 
Christ and a very different way of salvation. It is not the Christ of the apostles and prophets, and it's not the way of grace. It's not the way of faith alone in Christ alone, but the way of works or ceremonies. Christianity is Christ, who he is and what he's done. Experience, feeling, enthusiasm is important. It's all very good when it comes naturally from a knowledge of the truth, but it itself is not the truth, and it is not the standard of the truth. That is Scripture. What think ye of Christ? That was the question Jesus put to the Pharisees in Matthew 22, verse 42. What think ye of Christ? That is the important question, and it can only be answered from the Bible. Paul told the Thessalonians, examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. We examine and test teaching and doctrine and practice by Scripture. It is our authority. It alone is our authority. If you can't handle Scripture, if you don't know the Bible well, feelings and the, the force of persons, a person's personality may overwhelm you. And he or she may take you captive. It's those who know the truth, who hold to it and walk with Christ, walk in Christ. It is they who know the real thing and will not be taken in by error. And in verse 9, Paul explains why it is that we can trust in Christ fully and walk in Him. It's because in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In other words, Christ is God incarnate. God who became man with a real body and a genuine soul. There is nothing lacking in Him. He is fully God and fully man, the Son of God and second person of the Trinity. That's what Scripture teaches. It's what Paul taught specifically in chapter 1. It is true. Why would anyone be attracted to anything or anyone other than Him? Why? I ask that because He is sufficient. That's what Paul is saying. And we are in Him. As believers, we are in Him. That's all we need. That's what Paul says next in verse 10. And in Him you have been made complete. And He is the head over all rule and authority. The New International Version translates that a little more literally. And you have been given fullness in Christ. It means made complete, but the, the word that Paul uses here is that, made full. And Paul seems to have chosen to state it in this way because this word fullness, which he used also in verse 9, was probably a buzzword of the false teachers. They were, were teaching that while Jesus is good and Jesus is necessary, he's not enough, that uh, they had what would make people complete, that they would fill up what was lacking in Christ. He, they would make a person fit for all of the, the challenges in the world and all of the evil angels and powers that one would face. Now, the Roman Catholic Church might make a similar claim. We believe in Christ, we believe in the Trinity, and they do. They have sound, solid doctrines in, the area, in those areas. But they also would tell you Christ is not enough. We have what will make you complete. We have the sacraments, the mass, and baptism. We have mediators with God, the Pope and the priests here on earth, Mary and the saints in heaven. In fact, we have the treasury of merit, all the grace that was accumulated by the, 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 the great works of the great saints, and it's accumulated there in this treasury in heaven, and you can draw upon that, and so on. Paul would say two things. That's not biblical. Those are traditions of men. And second, Christ is sufficient. The fullness is in Him. He has conquered sin and all of the hostile spiritual angelic forces. He has overcome it all. That's biblical. Don't go outside of it. Stick with Scripture. That is our best defense against error. Walk in Christ. He is your life. Those who do will never get captured. The Comanches are out there and far worse. 
But we have a fort, a mighty fortress in His Christ. We are to walk in Him, to believe in Him, to to live in Him, to stay in the truth of Him. We do that through faith in the gospel and fidelity to His Word. Perseverance. Every believer has been put in Christ by sovereign grace. We have been firmly rooted in Him, and we are presently being built up in Him. His life is in us, and we can never be taken out of Him. But we are responsible, again, to persevere. God enables the believer to do that. And the believer will do that. But nothing will give us the the, the motivation to be faithful more than walking with Him, than personal devotion to Him that leads to obedience. Knowing Him personally. Remember Mark 14? We finished Mark just, what, a month or two ago, two months ago. Jesus and His disciples were in Bethany in the home of Simon, and Mary anointed the Lord with costly perfume. And all of the disciples rebuked her. What a waste, they said. And Jesus took up for her. Jesus said, let her alone. She has done a good deed to me. A few days later, one of those disciples betrayed Christ. One of those disciples denied him, denied him three times. And all of them deserted him. Mary stayed faithful. She was brave and true because she was devoted. She loved the Lord because she knew Him, and she seemed to have known more about Him than they did. The more we know, the more closely we will walk with Him, and the more we will love Him just naturally. So Tertullian asked, what indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What do the philosophers offer us that is better than what the apostles and the prophets offer? Nothing. The Word of God offers Christ Jesus the Lord. He is all sufficient and we have Him through faith alone. If you've not received Him, do so. And as Paul says, walk in Him. And if you do, you'll never go astray. But if you have not come to know Him, as we have, then we invite you to receive Him, as we have, to believe in Him. He is God the Son. He created all things. He holds all things together. What can be more sufficient than that? And He's the only Savior of sinners. He redeems us from sin and guilt. All who believe in Him are forgiven forever. They are made sons and daughters of God with a glorious future and an absolutely secure present. May God help you to trust in Him. And He will never disappoint you. Well, let's close with a hymn. And then following that, I'm going to close with not only a benediction, but a prayer for the meal that we're about to enjoy. But let's stand and sing hymn number 18 and the songs of praise in Christ alone. Hymn number 18. Father, what a great truth it is to know that regardless of how it ends for us, whether our life ends in death or He comes, we have that hope that He is coming. And we have the hope of heaven. We have the hope of glory as Paul describes it. And it's all because of your son and the price that he paid for us. We give you thanks for that. May we walk in him. Walk with devotion and increase in our knowledge and love for him. We thank you now, Lord, for the food that we're about to enjoy. We thank you for this meal that we can take together and pray that you would bless it and bless our fellowship together. We give you thanks for all the good things in life that you give us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.